Summer 2009, the last weekend in July, and with hundreds of history buffs, fans of rural literature and folk musicians who have travelled from all over Britain to visit Blackshall, a rural, isolated and rather unexceptional looking village in East Suffolk. Around us, on the temporary marquees in the playing fields, on the telegraph poles and on the wooden notice boards, the signs read, George Ewart Evans, a celebration. We're here to remember a writer and broadcaster whose books established him as the great chronicler of the countryside, especially around East Anglia, and whose working methods made him the founding father of the oral history movement in Britain. In his radio programmes, he never attempted to embellish his interviews. The speakers in this programme were recorded in East Anglia. They're introduced by George Ewart Evans, author of the book, The Horse in the Furrow. All the horsemen whose voices you hear are the bearers of a very long tradition. I left school and started work in 1900, then to Sparks, as Mr. Wilson took Sparks. He never farm. attempted to embellish his interviews. His idiosyncratic commentaries were a mixture of doting school teacher, open university lecturer, and kindly uncle. The horseman, perhaps more than any other countryman, is also able to recall the feeling and atmosphere of rural life in an arable farming region before the breakup of the old village community. Now, when you're controlling horses with no reins, if you wish them to go to the right, you say, wish, 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 wish. If you wish them to go to the left, you say, give me a hey, ho, 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 give me a, ho, ho, ho. And that's the way you control them without reins. Whether they do so in other counties like that, I don't know, but that's how we used to do. Evans's skill was to get ordinary farming people to open up and talk to him. He loved their language, the way they spoke. He'd ask straightforward questions about their working lives, their everyday routines, their hardships, their hunger. In the beginning, he scribbled the conversations down on paper, and then, crucially, he would later record them on tape. In spite of the primitive techniques, there can be no doubt that many country people consider the time before 1914 as the golden age. Like people used to come on the farm, you see, like all these tradespeople. That would give so much, perhaps uh, the harness maker would give so much, and the, all these people would do the, the, the seeds, that would give so much, and auctioneers give so much, and going that used to make a good bit, you see, and people used to have a real good old do. Nowadays, it's not so nice. It's not so nice on the land. Now you've got this mechanism. It's not so nice on the land as it was when we had the horses and used to go around with the wagons. It was more amusing there and more... There was more to look at and there was more freedom in the farm fields. You know, the children used to go in the fields. They're not allowed in the fields now. I mean, a case of the mechanism. But when I was a child, we used to go in the field with great big sticks and be running here and running there, catching rabbits, and we were as pleased as anything if we went home with a brace of rabbits. Unpretentious accounts were described in rigorous detail Testimonies of Harvest Customs and Rural Beliefs, filled 11 books, and the first one, and still his most famous, Ask the Fellows Who Cut the Hay, made Evans a cult figure at a time when increasing mechanisation was transforming our countryside. I asked Owen Collins, former researcher at the University of Aberystwyth, an expert on Evans, who his books appeal to today. I mean, I think George's books are very popular. I mean... People who would read Flora Thompson's Lark Rise to Candleford, Thomas Hardy's Return of the Native, uh, anything by Laurie Lee. I mean, these people will get a lot out of his books. I mean, there's something there for him or her. He was very, very faithful to the interviews he transcribed. There's very little in the way of purple prose. And I think part of the reason why his books are so appealing to many readers is because if you go back a few generations, this is the story of all of us. We're all connected to the land at some point. And his stories of bringing in the harvest or shearing sheep, it's a form of family history, isn't it? I mean, it's the stories we're all told, around the fireside, maybe. Evans was once described by Robert Graves as a wisest and most knowledgeable English folklorist. The historian E.P. Thompson was a devotee, and he still has a wide-ranging loyal following today. Academics, local historians, anthropologists and admirers like Melvin Bragg and poet Seamus Heaney. 
For over 20 years, I've been documenting people's stories, trying to match Evan's ability to get people to tell their stories clearly and naturally. And believe me, it's not as easy as it sounds. Evan's made the old locals feel special when farming the land was very tough work for little financial reward. I'm impressed by the way he got people to talk about the lack of food on the table without making them feel awkward. Thank God we always had enough to eat, but there was a lot of families. I mean, they did go hungry, yes. I know families, what I mean, you'd see them come to school because we used to have to take a dinners to school, you know. Well, I mean, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have any dry bread to eat. And I mean, they'd had, to, they'd had to have a cup of water, you know, with that. But I think the, ma the majority of people in those days, they cooked a lot of peas and made pea soup. Pea soup and a dumpling, Suffolk dumpling. In years gone by, they never had this here pure white flour. See, they had cheap stuff, and it was more like the pollard that we used to, but we'd feed pigs on now, you see. But in them days, it was cheap, and there wasn't a lot of money, and people had to eat what they could. You see, and it was just called, a, well, it was one of these here rough flowers, you see, that they make more or less like we make brown bread with. And that was what they called a the pollard dumpling. There was no sort or anything in it, it was just a hard dumpling, I suppose. The farm worker didn't have very much meat. No, they didn't think it was good for them to have much meat because it took too long to pick the meat out of the teeth while they were at work. Do you know, whenever you see a bit of beef on Christmas time, I saw we, I saw we see beef Christmas time. We shouldn't have that hand and give us, give it to us. A man named Lord Ransom used to live at Ransom Hall. He was a fat a bullock every year for all his people. And he used to have them go up, have a ticket and go up. There used to be a pound for your father, beef, you know, and a pound for your mother. Half a pound for each child, what you got. And a pound of sugar. A pound of plums and a half a pound of beef suet to make a pudding with. These conversations were recorded as Evans went round the village sitting at kitchen tables. People would talk about making do and hand-me-down clothes. And when you got something new, that was a special event. And my poor old father said, well, he would get me a pair of a boats made, which of course were made by our village shoemaker which was Mr. Newson, and he made me a pair of high kid top button boots, and the buttons come, they buttoned up the halfway up to the, the calf of my legs, and I wore them years and years, and I had, didn't dispose of them not two years ago. That's, uh, well, nearly or oh, 70 years ago. Yes, it is, because I'm 83, and so you count back at this. But the buttons, I really got some of the buttons now. At the Blacksall Celebratory Weekend, visitors in the Memory Marquee, exhibiting old maps and sepia photos, could also listen to archive recordings. Just across the road, in the Edwardian Village Hall, they're screening old films about the area. The building is packed to the rafters. For the younger ones, it's a chance to see how things look round here before they were born. And for some, like 87-year-old Alec Cable, accompanied by a friend, a flickering black and white film reveals his own father-in-law sharing a pint and a song in Blacksall's pub. He's one of the few locals left who clearly remembers what Evans did for his village. That brings tears to my eyes. How we lived in them days, and now it's different. But my father-in-law was on there. On the film we've just seen? Yeah, Wicketts, Alfred Richardson. This is it? Yeah. Obviously, for your generation, you saw how your, your, your father's and grandfather's mm -hmm. generation worked on the land. And yeah. The world is so different today. What, what lessons do we learn now, looking at these well, films? Looking at, looking well, at your... well, the lessons you learn from the day. Money don't mean everything. There was no money in them days, but everybody was happy. And I can't tell you much more than that. He come here and, and he live in Blacksville. He brought life to Blacksville. And it's lovely, yeah. 
his legacy, if you like, lives on because what he came and did here is the result of what we're having today. You know, that's continued the books that Blacksell produced and he, he, he somehow implanted something in the village which responded to that and produced the records and the works and the research they're doing today. Watching the film, hearing those songs. Lovely. They are lovely. Crash country life, and Yeah. And, and if these weren't recorded? Well, that's what I'm, I'm trying. I said, George Evans, he brought life back to Blackford. Yeah. Well, I don't feel like saying anymore, yeah. Natives of small villages like Blacksall didn't really talk to outsiders much in those days. But it didn't take long for George Ewart Evans to get them to share meaningful details of their lives, even though he was in every respect a stranger when he arrived. Evans was born a Welshman in 1909 in Abercunnan, a mining village in Glamorgan. He was one of 13 children. His father owned a grocer shop whose fortunes dipped and then collapsed as unemployment decimated the economy of the South Wales Valleys in the interwar years. Fired up by a love of athletics, he played and studied his way to Cardiff University. But with ambitions to be a writer and no work prospects in Wales, he migrated to England and a job teaching PE at a school in Cambridge. Here he met his wife Florence, who in 1948 accepted a job as the head teacher of the Blacksall Village School, and George became a house husband. His son Matthew, now Lord Evans, remembers that they struggled as much as their neighbours. I mean, we had nothing in our house. You know, we had no possessions. My father obviously had a lot of books, but we had no nice furniture. It was, um, you know, and it was the same in all the houses. So I didn't feel I was any different from any of the children in the village. Obviously, when um, I went away to a Quaker boarding school, I did feel different, but uh, until I was 10 or 11, I just was one of the boys. And, um, you know, we'd play football, we'd go up on the heath behind the, um, the well behind the school, and... Um, I would work on farms during the holidays, which I absolutely loved doing. And there it was. But um, I think as I've got older, I, I think my view of it as a sort of idyllic period of my life was a little selfish because I do think it was a very, very tough time for my parents. And I think there were very considerable strains on them and their marriage as a result of the fact that my father was earning nothing and my mother was supporting um, three children and her husband in a place which was, I mean, incredibly remote. You know, there was one bus a week. Um, I remember when my mother had all her teeth out and she must have been 50, 45 they have very bad teeth. She cycled to Saxmund, which is eight miles away, had all her teeth out and cycled back. Well, it's quite difficult to imagine that sort of thing happening nowadays. When pushed, Matthew Evans seems keen to talk about what was going on within the walls of his childhood home. But what about returning to Blacksall to give a presentation, Memories of My Father, to a packed village hall on the Saturday of the centenary weekend? I'd you know, have to talk to a sort of psychoanalyst, but I've never really had a wish to go back there. And I didn't much enjoy the Saturday. Now, why? I mean, is it because my childhood wasn't as idyllic as I thought? Was it that I, it was a sort of overlay to um, disguise the the way I felt that my parents the difficult time they were having there. You know, was this my escape to imagine it was wonderful and whatever. Local James Cecil was one of those attending Matthew's talk. Uh, his, his son said yesterday at the seminar, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, he said that uh, his father was very, very depressed and when he came here, it took him out of his depression and he had something good to do and he found this is what he wanted to do, record and write about Suffolk life, and he wrote those lovely books, yeah. 
Evans emerged out of his depression with an escape route. He'd later call it spoken history. He asked his neighbours to simply talk directly and naturally, telling him about every aspect of their lifetime's work. One of my favourites of these conversations are with the shepherds. By the 1950s, sheep had almost disappeared from the parish, so these tales were already being told to Evans in the past tense. Shepherding is a family skill. The last man's nephew is a practising shepherd and recalls a setup in his father's time when he first went as a shepherd's page or apprentice. These old uh, shepherds what used to meet up on the heathland, they used to have a, what they call a shepherd's meet. For the flocks that used to go up there, used to have what, uh, like a little den cut out in the wind bushes. When they, they walked the sheep on the common or That's the right. sheep walks. And, and every, every shepherd had his own section. And them sheep used to go up there so regular that they'd, they'd never cross the path onto the other man's sheep. They'd never get mixed. It's interesting to hear Evan's technique. I feel that nowadays, interviewers like myself try to ask emotive questions, prompting people to perform to the microphone. But Evans didn't waste words. His questions were super blunt. As Evans probed, he delved deeper into the communal memory bank. The darker, less respectable aspects of survival and what constituted work also came to the surface. In a 1965 BBC Third programme, The Old Rural Community, a shepherd is telling him something of the hidden economy. He also recalled the close link between shepherds and smugglers, which once existed on the coastal heathlands of Suffolk. Blacksville was quite a native place of it. And as a boy, going keeping sheep with my father up on the heath, heathlands from Iken to Blacksville, I think that the shepherds in them days worked with the smugglers because they always had a little old stocking with some gold sovereigns that other workers never had. Um, in what way did they help the smugglers? Well, they had a meeting point and the shepherd used to go and call out so many sheep and he used to follow the tracks of the horses when they used to go, the pack horses. Uh, they used to put a saddle on them and they used to have a, uh, a net each side and they could drop a barrel, like a small barrel of brandy or rum in or even uh, a good bag of tobacco tea, which they used to get in them days, and uh, they used to let the sheep feed until they returned, and then from the road across those hatlands, the sheep used to follow behind the horses to cover the tracks, and of course, quite natural, everybody thought the shepherds had been about a good time in the morning, and nobody knew no difference. Back in the 18th century, the Suffolk smugglers were in their heyday, and nearly everyone was at it. Evans' informants, as he liked to call them, reveal a direct link to those times when adventure gave a spice to otherwise dull working lives. Although he was a leader in the community and made no secret of his voracious reading, he always made it clear he came from a mining community and hated authority figures. He must have enjoyed hearing how the commoners scored over the landed gentry. I know one poacher here... He hadn't been dead many years now. He died an old man. He he poached all his life, and he never did get caught. And and how he done it was a marvellous thing. He'd go into this Easter wood, and perhaps he'd go right here to Chebdoran about, you know, into another wood another night. Another night he'd be on the Marcus Bristol's estate. Then he'd go to Saxon estate. Never was caught. He never went twice one place. He never went one wood one night and then went the next. How did he catch his birds? Well, he used to shoot them. He had a muzzle load of gun. You know, he had to load the gun with, with shot and powder, load it yourself, you know, and ram it and that. And I've known him to shoot 13 and 14 in a night. What did he do with them then? Well, this particular poacher, he used to make a hamper and then take them, take them into Barry, you know, to, uh, well, Mr. Whips, the man's name was, what bought them, bought them, and he'd have a spy. He'd get him just to walk down, you know, to see whether there was any, any farmer or any authority, like from same as Hargrove, and if there wasn't anybody there, because he used to go in and just hand the hamper, you see, and the chap would take it out of sight and, 
and park them. And then he used to go back and fetch his money. The cockbirds used to make a, a half a crown, and the hen birds about two shillings, and a hare, you know, would make about a half a crown. That was the time when wages about ten or twelve shillings a week. That's right. So he 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 he'd make a good week's work one night. I remember as a student watching a BBC programme where an elderly man walks through a churchyard and hears Many the voices of the dead. came to rest alongside their neighbours near the 14th century church of St Peter. I recorded the voices of some of them on magnetic tape nearly a quarter of a century ago. That's the trouble today, so many churches... It seemed decidedly creepy at the time. Now I know that the churchyard was in fact St Peter's on the outskirts of Blacksall and the man was George Ewart Evans. He had good posture, but seemed awkward on camera. He was returning to look at the graves of some of the people he'd once interviewed and befriended, like the old bell ringer. Henry Puddock died last year, didn't he? Yes, yes. What was his age, sir? Yeah, I think he was on his 84. 84? Yes. And uh, he'd been ringing, oh. well, a short time before his death, hasn't he? Oh, yes, he was up there about three weeks before he died. Was he? He was up there about three weeks before he died, yes. He was very keen, wasn't he? Oh, Hollis was. Hollis was. Yes, very keen. He'd been to, well, one could say, hundreds of churches. Yes. Didn't he? Oh, yes, 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 and a good ringer too. Good striker. Good striker. Yes, yeah, good striker. Yes. How did he strike? By 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 rope sight or by by ear always? You ring by ear. Good ringer. He ring by ear. Yeah. In that film, he also stands at the grave of his neighbour, Priscilla Savage. He selected some of his recordings of her in his radio programmes. Here she's chatting about a high point of the village calendar. Evans didn't often interview women. When he did, it was usually about fashion, food and festivals. On a Whit Wednesday at uh, Blacksville Ship, when John Hewitt, the licensee, held the licence. Oh, yes, yes. And, of course, he used to have... Uh, what he called his Ash Wednesday Fair. I see. He used to have sports for men, women and children. Then there was, the women had some competition connected with tea drinking, didn't they? Yes. They used to drink hot, a hot cup of tea, the hottest could be drank, in so many minutes, and then they used to have a quart of tea for that, the, the as a prize. Who, 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 who Don't get the quickest. Most quickly. Yes. And uh, your mother often used to win a pound. I always used to re win the prize, more or less. She used uh, to be the quickest drinker. They always said she had a tin mouth. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how did, she, did she have any... My mother had got a take of uh, getting her mouth well greased with the bread and butter before she drank her tea. Oh, I see, yeah. So she drank her tea the quickest. It's the voice born into a distant Victorian age that lives on in Evans' books and in his popular BBC broadcasts. In fact, it was his casual conversations with Priscilla's husband, Robert Savage, then a retired shepherd, who was a great talker that got him started. Sadly, Robert died before Evans began tape recording his interviews. Evans would later write, Robert Savage was my interpreter, it was he who gave me entry to what was a foreign country that without his help I would never have known. Did you watch your father in action? Yes. In communication, in yeah. conversation? Yes. Would, would he be sitting down with people in their homes, just asking them questions, walking around the village? Yeah, walking around the village or Robert Savage would say, you must go and talk to X. So he'd go and talk to X and, you know, the the network, well, people love talking about what they're doing and presumably nobody had ever come up to somebody and said, look, you keep sheep, I want to talk to you about, you know, keeping sheep or you keep horses and what sort of potions you use to control them and everything. So I think this was one of the reasons why everybody was so receptive to him because it was a unique experience for them. Looking over the open heathland beyond the groups of yellow-bricked and slate-tiled cottages scattered throughout Blacksall, I recall Evans's conversation with the proud postman, Cyril Herring, recorded half a century ago. Well, you'd say Blacksall is a pretty di difficult village for a, for a postman. Yes, uh, uh, more difficult than most post rounds. Uh, the reason being that... Uh, uh, 
very few people leave Blacksall and uh, it means that most families are intermarried. And again, um, houses here are not numbered and very few uh, with names. So you have to actually know the people, uh, know the names and know the Christian names. Uh, and uh, any strange postman would find it absolutely, absolute bedlam to have to deliver amongst these uh, 40 Lings and 20 Smiths, uh, etc. So many, um, so many of the people uh, have the same names. Have the same names, yeah. And you have to sort them out. I have to sort them out, and we very often get, well, I have got the same initials. You get, uh, for instance, two... J.W. Lings, both having separate houses, both living on the same common. How do you manage that? Well, uh, I know from experience, uh, perhaps one is a farmer and the other is a roadman, and I know from then a little from where the letters come from, which is which. When I first heard Evans's radio programmes, I thought he sounded rather formal and brusque, and maybe a bit patronising. Perhaps it was the way he spoke, his son, Matthew. What was fascinating about my father, or one of the things, that when he was with Welsh people, he spoke and spoke Welsh. There was a music to his voice, which was extraordinary. Flowed, unhesitant, whatever. English was his second language. And also, I think that if you're deaf, or as deaf as he was, it's very difficult to modulate your voice. During the war, Evans was aware that he was becoming deaf. In 1950, he acquired a Madresco hearing aid on the national health. He felt that it changed his life, though it did give him the appearance of being disabled. This didn't stop him from really enjoying the singing tradition of the community. Well, we ploughed the land and we planted it and we watched the barley grow. We rolled it and we had it in and we cleaned it with the hoe. Although he was never then a collector of song in the tradition the of Cecil Sharp or his contemporaries Ewan McCall and Charles Parker. Get out your size and sharp and boys, it's time for barley mow. <laughs> The place where people still gather to make music in Blacksall is the pub. Although Evan shied away from the place at the time, adhering to his wife's Quaker beliefs about alcohol. This is the Ship Inn. It was supposed to be called the Sheep Inn, but local legend says a travelling sign writer misunderstood the landlord's accent. In the main bar, people are sitting and standing around a few boards of wood on the floor. A makeshift stage for step dancing. Even though this pub has become something of a magnet to the travelling folk singers, the local stalwarts, like Blacksall-born twins Colin and Clive Warner, really appreciate their enthusiasm for the old songs and traditions. And they were eager to talk about Evans, who was a kind of father figure, an unofficial scoutmaster, organising sports and nature trails. Well, I remember years ago he used to talk... Well, I was only seven, six, seven... He took us up to the uh, heath, which was behind the council houses, which Blacksville Heath we used to call it. Went up there, we, we got a snake, and I remember years ago, uh, Ewan Evans, well, that, I don't know if that is dead, how we become by it, but as an adder, and we operated on it, and he showed us the, the insides and, and whatever that was, and how that. Uh, develop what sort of thing it was and you uh, felt it and that was smooth and all that sort of stuff you know and it, I think that uh, I don't know that had babies in it but that was dead anyway he explained to you what what the inside of a snake was and made you feel it and everything like that you know well, it's fascinating man it's yeah. fascinating yeah. just hearing the song of the barley this, this is a classic song yeah, yeah, good, yeah, luck yeah. Yeah. good luck to the barley mow good luck to the barley mow good luck to the company good luck to the barley mow to the company the landlord the landlady the barmaid the barrel the gallant pot court pot pint pot till pot half a till lily good pen pen mow and his luck is luck to the barley mow before he discovered the tape recorder 
George Ewart Evans had been dutifully transcribing and shaping his handwritten notes of his conversations with Blacksall folk. His manuscripts were rejected by bewildered publishers, until in 1956 an unsolicited manuscript of Ask the Fellows Who Cut the Hay found its way to Faber and Faber. His youngest daughter, Susan. When George first sent his manuscript of Ask the Fellows Who Cut the Hay to Faber's, it was read by one of their readers, Jan Perkins. She wrote on the bottom of um, the letter that came with the manuscript, Mr Evans has collected stories from the oldest inhabitants of his Suffolk village, which he presents against a background of old country customs and manners. If he were not so revoltingly pompous and pedantic, this book might be interesting for the way of life it recaptures. As it stands, it is dulled by the author's personal interpolations. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. That's, uh, that's, well, he was saved, though, because even though there was, that was the big R of rejection, someone yes, else got yes, to Yes, yes, no, a very, a very um, uh, different person, Morley Kennelly, who was the American director of Faber's, wrote on the same letter, this book is a joy, underline, most readable, nothing patronising or ye oldie about it, and the author's treatment is just right. These aren't nostalgic That's romps right. into, right. into the agricultural yesterdays, no, are they? No, no, they're not. There was nothing nostalgic about it, no, no sense that this past was better. In fact, he would say the past was not. No, I mean, my memory of this man was of a very professional person who knew what he wanted to do once he decided and was doing it. And there were no trimmings on the side. You know, he wasn't sentimental. He wasn't nostalgic. He wasn't reverential to the people he was talking to. He was just a smart, ordinary guy, actually not ordinary, who had this extraordinary ability of making people talk to him. And that was his secret. Now, quite what this secret was, I don't know. From his youth, Evans believed that old folk carried stories that he wanted to tap. As an undergraduate in Wales talking to miners, he felt it was a conversation totally amongst the equals. He joined the Communist Party in the 1930s, Owen Collins, former researcher at the University of Aberystwyth and Evans expert. In Ask the Fellows to Cut the Hay, towards the end of the book, he refers to the Rococo facade of British democracy. If you want to understand his politics, I think you have to take his work, his books as a whole, and, and read between the lines to a certain extent. Um, the message is there, but it's not blatant. I think in his personal life, uh, in his personal politics and in conversation, I think he was more political, more overtly political, I should say. He was certainly consistent in his politics. Uh, he never sold out um, by any stretch of the imagination. He remained a communist by conviction to the end of his life, and I think he remained a Welsh nationalist as well. I mean, he visited China in the 1980s to look at peasant agriculture there. As farming went, he believed the people that he interviewed were linked together as kind of units of production. He, he saw the village as a factory. People needed to be together to bring in the harvests and to shear sheep and, and everything. I mean, there was an economic explanation behind social structure in a kind of Marxist interpretation. When it came to local politics, he got involved in the debate about the quality of the local water with pesticides uh, running off the land into the water table. In that respect, he was an outwardly political person. And, of course, his chief concern throughout his life was rural poverty, rural hunger. I mean, he must be the only person in the world who would justify the Russian invasion of Hungary, which I remember him doing to me, <laughs> clearly. And it was that early experience in Wales, I think, that did it. The, you know, the, the shop that went bankrupt and... The other extraordinary perspective about that was that um, it was taken over by the co-op. 
for the rest of his life, my father did everything through the co-op. When he lived in Brook, there was a wonderful garage a hundred yards from the house, but he insisted on taking his mini to be serviced by the co-op in Norwich, which took a whole day. He was buried by the co-op, he shot at the co-op. Brilliant. George made no secret of taking the side of the underdog in this 1965 radio programme, The Rural Community. What burned into the farm worker most of all was the feeling of being tied, of being treated less than a man and having his human dignity continually assaulted. It's this, I think, that has given the older East Anglian farm worker his most bitter memories. He fixed the blame where he thought it belonged the rural trinity of squire, parson and farmer. You see, the farmer used to be with the parson, and the parson used to help the people as much as he could, but he, he was like the rest, he hadn't got much to give away. Because I reckon years ago, a parson was paid with the, uh, with the farmer, didn't they? It was said that the squire says to the old parson, I'll keep them poor, and El Parsons said, yes, I'll keep them ignorant, although they did start the school, so you've got to give them that. But I should say, the conditions, really, of the agricultural worker, and they'd conditioned him to it, absolutely, they had conditioned him to it. If a farmer got a good man, and he'd give notice to leave, the farmer would go around and tell all the neighbouring farmers not to employ him, and try and starve the man out. That was our idea. Yes. The 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 working the working class was real down and out. Well, at that time, back, my son, he'd had to go to work, you know, along of me. If I tried to get him on another job, or in a trade or anything, that farmer had to, had to turn me out of the house and sack me. They used to more or less climb him. I think they were more or less afraid of the uh, parson in those days. They would come into the house, they used to say they'd come into the house and uh, even look in the saucepan and see what you had for dinner. I suppose he's interested to see what the uh, working man had got for his dinner. See that he wasn't living too high. That's right. <laughs> yes, I don't think he was living too high. <laughs> Well, they were afraid of losing their job, you. A lot of farm workers were in those days because if they went to church on the Sunday morning with a, a new pair of trousers or cloth trousers, they might probably get the sack on the Monday morning. What was the idea? Why, why do... To distinguish the uh, working man from the uh, squires of the village. Corduroy was his wear, and he had to stick to it, I suppose, though. Corduroys and buskins, hobnail boots. Even though that's quite a political slice of testimony, there's something quite comical about it. It might seem odd that someone who thought of himself as a socialist would also be intrigued by superstitions, spells, witchcraft and fanciful yarns. But Evans felt the power of nature and folk remedies was all part of a common collective memory bank that connected everybody. He was fascinated that the people who worked with horses had an intuitive understanding of them. He refers over and over to the practice of jading, the ability to make a horse stand as though it was bewitched or paralysed. This is Horsepower and Magic, first broadcast on the BBC's third programme in 1964. The horse and the horseman were the bearers of what is undoubtedly one of the most ancient traditions in these islands. This tradition arose from the soil, was of the soil and remained tied to the soil for centuries, right up to the last few years when the direct link has been broken. These horsemen, who are in direct line with the ancient tradition, were very few, at least in East Anglia, and they kept the law very close indeed, resorting to all kinds of hocus-pocus and mystification to prevent the uninitiated from coming near their secrets. Besides, not so long ago, these horsemen, who claimed to be able to rice or stop a horse, jeered him, they said in East Anger, by supposed magical means, were laying themselves 
open to the accusation of witchcraft. Some horsemen were actually tried as witches, and they had to be careful. Up to recent times, some of this atmosphere of dark, inexplicable power still remained. The horseman was often unable to draw the line between actual reality and the content of his own thought. The old horseman also carried a frog's or toad's bone, which acted as a jadin substance after it had been steeped. The method and ritual of getting the frog's bone is very ancient. It was known in India from earliest times, as Sir James Fraser records. The method of obtaining it was exactly the same as that used in Suffolk within living memory. Well, getting the frog's bone ready was the biggest problem. If anybody didn't know how to get that ready to use, I mean, that's no good at all. That, that was done in various ways. One way was the frog must be hung on a blackthorn bush until that was dead, and that was no good killing one and then getting the bone. And then that was taken off the bush after so many hours, taken to a running stream till all the flesh was washed off. And then the bone which floated upstream was the one which you kept. And then that was taken and pickled in a mixture of various things for so many hours. And then that was fit to use. You carried it in your waistcoat pocket. But uh, with that, you'd got complete control of a horse. If you'd got a frog's bone in your pocket, I mean, they'd, they'd do anything you want them to do. Some commentators about George Ewart Evans have their doubts whether he took the magic seriously, or perhaps he was just going along with a good yarn. Owen Collins has his own theory. He took magic very seriously. Somewhere deep down, I think, he wanted to... Well, perhaps he did believe in it. I mean, he did rationalise it. Uh, we can't say that he didn't, but I feel as though sometimes he he didn't reach far enough to explain what was going on. I think the the romance of the story uh, was perhaps of more interest to him than than an explanation that perhaps other historians would reach for. This all ties into his belief in a prior culture, this idea of an amorphous collective memory, this idea of an oral tradition which is held by a group of people, which is particularly strong, he thought, in closely knit rural communities. I mean, this idea of a prior culture, which he believed went all the way back to pre-Roman days in Britain. An example would be when he was growing up in North Wales, for example. He said that horses drew sledges that had been designed in Roman times. I mean, he saw this continuity. He could be a bit misty-eyed. A lot of people have said that he didn't deal in nostalgia, but if you look at his work, he says this. He, in black and white, he prints it on the page. You know, I specialise in nostalgia. But, I mean, I don't think nostalgia has to be culturally conservative. Uh, nostalgia can be radical, and certainly with his political beliefs, it was. While you might wistfully remember, you know, X and Y, A and Z, it doesn't mean you necessarily want a return of A through to Z. It was... Uh, leaky thatch roofs and empty stomachs is what George wrote about. And, of course, the people he interviewed said, don't tell me about the good old days. They were mean old days. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely clear. It seems that the magical elements in the programmes were actively encouraged by his producer at the BBC, David Thompson, whom Evans described as having the sensitivity to absorb the less obvious nuances of the countryside. Here's their co-creation, The Hare, a complete portrait of an animal, somewhat bizarrely broadcast on the third programme on Christmas Day, 1966. The inference is that the hare is like an ordinary human being who used to have his hands disposed across his breast in death. In fact, behind it is the belief that the hare was only partly an animal. At times it was undoubtedly human, a witch. The uncanniness of the hare is borne out by the awe with which the old rural community in Britain regarded it. It's unlucky if it crosses your path. A pregnant woman seeing a hare must rip her dress to prevent her child being born with a hare lip, and fishermen should not pronounce its name while at sea. Like the pig, the hare was linked with the moon goddess, or Diana, and some have suggested that the taboo on eating hare flesh 
is evidence for regarding the animal as closely linked with the old religion of the Celts. On the other hand, the primitive aversion to hair flesh may be pure homeopathic magic. The hare is a timid creature. If I eat its flesh, I too will be of no use in battle. Yet it's true that hare's flesh is naturally indigestible, even to dogs. The master of the game advised that after a day's hunting, its flesh should not be given to the hounds. They should have only the tongue and the kidneys and some bread soaked in its blood. Hare's meat is strong and has to be expertly prepared before it is fit for the table. Oh, uh, no, dark meat. Uh, blood. Yes. Well, well, look at one of the old recipes, shall we? Uh, oh. uh, before you do that, um, when you say blood, there's a lot of blood in the hair, you mean? Yes, like murder, to yes. get it ready. And uh, did, they, did they treat it in any way? Oh, yes, in this district. Joints of hair were steeped in a pile of milk to draw out the blood oh, before they started the cooking. Another aspect that contributed to the traditional mystery about the hair is its sex. In the Master of Game, for instance, the hair is referred to both as a he and a she in the very same sentence. The Elder Pliny records the fable that the hair is of many and various sexes. Under the old Gwentian Code of Welsh Laws, the hair was said not to be capable of legal valuation, being in one month male and in another female, and that the buck will sometimes give birth to the young. Now, this ambivalence seems to have persisted in East Anglia up to the present. Country folk in this district speak of a jack hare and a sally, but a little before my time, a hare was called a bandy because of the shape of its legs, you know. Oh, yeah. Bow-legged, or bowen, as the old boys used to say. Women were all in a pucketary when a hare crossed their path. It was a witch in disguise, they said. A wizard sometimes, I guess, because a hare was supposed to change its sex every year, wasn't it? Six years after this broadcast, Evans and his producer, David Thompson, co-wrote The Leaping Hare, a strange compendium of legends and anecdotes about the mythology of the hare. It's the book that you either love or hate. One Cambridge anthropologist described it as a jumble of fantasy and misstatement. But I can't help respecting the fanaticism of the project. Ironically, it's also one of Evans' most academic books, littered with footnotes and appendices. He never considered himself as an academic, nor did he communicate with other historians, or in fact anybody else in his field, which makes the collaborations with Thompson particularly special. In fact, Evans hated the idea of even being called an oral historian. Owen Collins again. I don't think George did particularly like the phrase. I mean, he thought it was an Americanism. Uh, I mean, he never called himself an oral historian. You know, he felt so strongly about it that uh, he actually called one of his books spoken history. I think he felt that oral history sounded ugly and, well, clinical, really. I mean, it is rather an unfortunate term. The, uh, the historian uh, Dean Abson joked that it sounded like a cross between a porn film and a dentist surgery. George also felt that it smacked the academy. If he associated himself with any academic tradition, it would have been social anthropology in the kind of Scandinavian tradition, quite folky. Basically, he said what he did was fireside chats. However, I mean, I think unquestionably he is Britain's first oral historian. I'd agree with that. He was dogged about what he did and consistent in his approach. What he didn't do was what we call a life story interview, methodically asking somebody about their evolution from childhood to adulthood, or what people really felt about their experiences. It's not about how you feel and are you depressed, are you happy, da -da -da. it's what you did, mechanics of the way of life that was the thing that was of paramount importance and interest to him. He saw himself as a backward traveller, imagining his own fiction of the past. Not that he didn't admire fiction, he'd written a novel as a young man and wrote poetry, but success with fiction had eluded him. His portraits of country people nevertheless had prepared the ground and established a feeling for writing about village life that caught on. In 1969, Ronald Blythe wrote Aikenfield, though about real people, it was not a real village. 
The book was a bestseller, and five years later, a feature film was based on it, directed by Peter Hall. Evans's children, Matthew and Susan. The sad thing is that Aikenfield is regarded as a sort of iconic book about a village. I mean, I remember his anger was extraordinary. When he wrote his books, and I know this from later on when I used to speak to him about it, he wanted what he wrote to be absolutely accurate. He didn't want to put his own interpretation on it, except in his comments. He wanted what people said to him to go down in an entirely correct way. And that's why he was so furious about Aikenfield, because it was a composite village. It wasn't an honest village, he said. It's made up. It's not allowed. I said, of course it's allowed. But it's interesting, of course, that Ronald Bly's Aikenfield was incredibly widely praised. It was a widely... It's a very good book. But if you look at it from George's honest perspective... I can see why he was upset. But actually, a few years later, he took a plunge and wrote a novel called Aki, a title uncannily resembling Bly's Aikenfield. In 1973, Evans was interviewed on Radio 4. George Ewart Evans is author of a number of well-documented books about country life in East Anglia. And these books contain records of the folklore and oral traditions of these communities. He believes that some of the old values can still be preserved, though the communities as communities have disappeared. His latest book, Aki, is in a sense a new departure for the author. It's not a documentary work, but fiction, short stories. He talked to John Pickford about this fictional approach to a subject he's already treated in a documentary form. I found more scope and I found, strange enough, of more truth in the fictional because in fiction, you can get this imponderable atmosphere, which is there in a village if you live long enough, but it's very hard to pin down. And I think the only true way of doing that is through the characters. You particularly wanted to get across the feeling of the place, the feeling of the characters, the fact that this man was, in a sense, um, intelligent, in a different sense from a townsman's intelligence, but he was intelligent. When I, when I came to this particular village, which is the background of Aki, I had a feeling immediately after we'd lived there for a few months that there was a tremendous historical atmosphere there and the characters had something about them that grew out of this ancient feel of the village. And this character, Aki, that I imagine, I think bears some of that tradition, a very ancient tradition. It's in his blood, so to speak. He does things not by reasoning so much, but by Intuition. He never read a book, for instance. He did his work. He farmed by intuition. Intuition and the tradition that he'd been, that had come down from his forebears, his father, grandfather, and so on. And this is a tradition passed on by word of mouth, isn't it? It's it's an oral tradition. Yes, chiefly by word of mouth and tales, folklore, and so on. As you say, everything he does, he seems to do by a sort of instinct. Well, I'll tell you a little story which illustrates this. When I came to the village, I didn't know the people very well. I sat on the parish council and some problem came up. I forget what it was and I was sure in my mind that's the solution to the problem. (laughs) So I spoke up and I think it had the majority decision. But an old farmer who I didn't know very well, he took the very opposite view and he didn't have very many reasons to back it up. But in the long run, his view was right. I was wrong. (laughs) It shows that it's very, very and very practical. Do you think there's any kind of hope of a resuscitation of this sort of community? Well, I think it can, it can never be in the same form, obviously. The old community was there chiefly because it was a community of work, and they were all related by the work, by farming in most cases. But I'm quite sure it can, by treating it from the educational standpoint, that all, all the children of a certain area were educated together, and they grew up together, and from the standpoint of organising those various cultural activities that go on that help to make, to to rebuild and give cohesion to a a community that's not naturally joined by the work as the old community was. It sounds artificial, but uh, I, I can't see any other method 
by which we can evolve and stop the big drain to the town and the, well, making a desert out of the country. No more to walk in the harvest field, no more to the 100 years after his birth, Blacksaw still has a strong sense of identity. The talks, the films, the stories that people were swapping hardly make this Suffolk village seem like a desert. Well, it was really buzzing that weekend. George Ewart Evans was also right to predict the explosion of interest in oral culture. Today, these voices can be heard everywhere, from local history magazines to museum audio displays to their role in television success stories like Who Do You Think You Are, where well, there's always a sequence where the celebrity is led to a real person to hear what it was like in the old days. And back in his Welsh birthplace, the University of Glamorgan now hosts the George Ewart Evans Centre for Storytelling. Evans died in 1988. If I went round Blacksall today with a recorder, I would still adhere to George's approach to be a conduit for people's stories. But his special skill is one that almost none of us have today, to live among his informants, as he always preferred to call them, and give people the time to be themselves. I envy him for that. He made an anonymous village the springboard for his life's work. <laughs>